Hello, and welcome to the Congressional Report. I'm Charles Clapsaddle, Station Manager for Manatee Educational Television. And it's our great pleasure to welcome back to our studios Representative Vern Buchanan for an update what's happening in Congress. Congressman Buchanan, it's always a great pleasure to see you, sir. And to get it straight, what's happening up in Washington? It's been a busy time. Well, Charles, thanks for what you do for Manatee County. It's very important. Well, I have to ask you, Congressman, you just, the House, recently just passed uh, the new tax reform legislation. It's a big package. First of all, tell us about it and why you think this is an important tax reform package. I think the big issue is growth in our country. We're growing at one, one and a half percent. In essence, we're going backwards. The goal is to try to get us to three, three and a half percent. That'll mean better paying jobs for America and help small businesses. So that's why it's so critical. It's been 30 some years. There's a lot of special deals that have been made over that period of time. And we're trying to focus on how to give working families a tax cut as well as small business people. We're looking to lower their rates for a lot of most small businesses down to 9%. We're sure. trying to supercharge the economy. But if we can get growing from uh, you know, one and a half uh, in the last 10 years to three, three and a half, four percent. That makes all the difference in, in the world for working families. Now, the, the House, uh, you know, passed this and it's moved on to the Senate. Tell us, in your opinion, you know, what are the chances now facing it when it goes before the Senate for consideration? Uh, this week, you know, we're hopeful that they're going to pass it out of the Senate. Uh, then they'll have their version and our version in the House. It's going to be different. And then we'll go to conference. Uh, I think we'll get something done there. And I do believe it'll pass out of the Senate this week as well. Get something done in conference. And then we both got to come back and re-vote it. Uh, then it goes to the president for his signature. I think we get it done by the end of the year. It'll be a big benefit, again, to working families, small businesses, which create most of the jobs in the country. That's pretty optimistic to think, uh, you know, that it's going to get passed by the end of the year. You know, the clock's ticking. You only have a few weeks left. But, you know, the question arises then, sir, you know, doesn't this fall then into partisan politics, you know, when it gets back up? Is it still as partisan and as dysfunctional as it seems sometimes? It is. I co-chair the Florida delegation. We have the third largest delegation in the country, 29 members of Congress. But we find ways we can get together on citrus greening. Uh, in terms of helping veterans with their issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of things we can work together on. And when we get together on a bipartisan basis, we can work with our leaders on both sides of the aisle and get things done. And again, I, I just look at citrus green as one of the things we're working on now. We feel comfortable we're going to get something done and bring some relief to them, especially after the hurricane. Well, you know, it's a good point that you bring up, Congressman, because we, you know, just now a couple of short months since we went through Hurricane Irma. And again, I have to take my hat off to you. You were at a lot of emergency shelters and the operations center during uh, Hurricane Irma, um, you know, lending your support, seeing what you can do at a federal level. Uh, you're both in Manatee and Sarasota. Is that correct? Yeah. On the night of the hurricane, I was in Manatee County at the EOC. Uh, their facility, I guess it's geared up for a category category four or five, right. but I was mainly there to work with them in terms of the federal uh, response, what we could do to be helpful to the citizens in this county. And I was very impressed with our first responders and our leadership, commissioners as well as the mayor right. and others that were very active and engaged through that. It was nice to see everybody coming together to try to get businesses and people back in their homes quickly. Well, one of the major things that was impacted was the citrus, citrus industry. Uh, and, you know, already we're suffering from the greening effect. Tell us a little bit more about, you know, your efforts on behalf of the citrus industry. In terms of greening, as well as what happened with this hurricane, I think they, you know, people report they lost 80, 90 percent of their crop, a lot of different uh, scenarios, and we're trying to do what we can. I've got a bill that'll be able to write off uh, replanting quicker. Mm -hmm. I think it'll mean $100 million into the industry. I can't imagine Florida without its orange juice. It's right. a big industry, creates a lot of jobs, and we've got to find a way we can work together to get that done. Um, hopefully we get some relief to them by the end of the year. That's my goal. Well, one of the key things, too, about the uh, citrus industry is that, you know, we have to be competitive as well. You know, you have, you have such a, so much competition from other countries around the world who are trying to import as well. So Florida is known for its citrus. We want to keep that, you know, profitable. And let me just say that we've got a lot of good farmers and ranchers 
Uh, we got great growers in the state of Florida. Florida, they do create hundreds of thousands of jobs. We've got to make sure that we're there to protect them when they need help. Uh, but again, they, they've created a lot of jobs. It's part of our history, part of our culture in the state, and we've got to make sure they're strong going forward. Now, Congressman, I want to take a few moments, if I may, to talk about something that's, that's very near and, and dear to your heart, and I've seen you speak on numerous occasions about that, and that is about our veterans. You know, Sarasota Manatee is home to over 80,000 veterans. That's a great deal in this area. Um, whether you're working on behalf of the Sarasota National Cemetery or you work on health care on behalf, you know, veterans are a very important part of this community, about the fabric of our community. Um, and one of the things that you recently passed was the veteran ID card. Um, tell us a little bit about that. What's the status of it right now and why it's so important? I do a lot of town halls. I get half the people come to our town halls. It seems to be veterans. And one of the big things they want, if you didn't serve 20 years, uh, you don't have a, a veteran's ID card. Beyond 20, you get one. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you got to carry around a bunch of documents. Many of them mm -hmm. have lost those documents. But it just gives them a sense of they've got an ID card that they can use it for various things, whether it's discounts or just be able to show that they served in the military. But there's a lot of things that it's important to them. We were able to uh, introduced that bill as a result of thoughts that I heard in town halls uh, and we got got it on the president's desk and got it signed and now we're in the process of releasing them they'll be free to all our veterans we have 22 million veterans in the country but in our area as you mentioned 70 80 thousand veterans this is one of the big issues that they would really like some support on and we're going to be able to deliver on that quickly and another thing, if I may, I think your staff is very responsive to veteran needs, too, whether it's a thing with a GI Bill or housing or medical issues. Your staff is very, very responsible to, to the concerns of veteran community. Yeah, we have uh, staff here in Mantee County and Sarasota County, and they're there for the veterans if they've got an issue or something that's been impacted or medals that they've earned or feel like they've earned that they sure. haven't got. We're there to serve them. And uh, you mentioned earlier the, na the National Veterans Cemetery is world class. It was some of the one of the things when I first got elected that they wanted to see uh, consummated, and we've been uh, very successful in being able to help to get that done. But again, at the end of the day, I tell people I'm humbled to be a congressman, but I'm a representative. I've got 80,000 veterans. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure what they've been promised, health care and other things, that they we deliver on that. Um, we're going to put the uh, address and the phone number of your, of your local offices up on the screen. So if there are veterans out there that have a question, they feel that you know, perhaps you could help them with it, we would encourage them to contact your office to see what could happen. Yeah, and contact our office. If they need some help, we'll meet with them. Uh, if they feel like they aren't being treated fairly or something's not getting done, we're there on behalf to uh, make sure that we can do everything we can to get their issue addressed. And many times the VA has multiple... Uh, hundreds of thousands of people they're working on various issues but many times we can take a veteran locally they get a hold of us we work closely right. with the VA and get it on top of the stack ideally uh, and we've we've had pretty good success in addressing our veterans needs now Congressman, I want to switch gears uh, if I may here because uh, this next issue I want you to take a few minutes to talk about is very serious and this area is considered the epicenter of the heroin use, um, an overdose. You've been working on legislation for many years to help fight heroin and drug abuse. Tell us about the bills that you've co-sponsored. What's the status? I know both at the state level, you, know, you have Representative Boyd who's working on you know, things at the state level as well. But wh how are you going to try to impact and, and make a, a difference in this problem? When I got involved and ran for office, it wasn't something I thought about, especially in Manatee County. But I can tell you in the last three to four to five years, we've had mothers that have come in, uh, three mothers and one day they came in, lost their sons. I've had a good friend, the uh, father lost his son. Uh, it's devastating. A lot of it's with these prescri prescription drugs. Uh, it starts out with an injury and then they end up uh, ODing and it's just been uh, really horrible. So uh, one of the things we have got done, I supported a bill where we got about $500 million at the end of the year, I think 27 million comes to Florida. I want to make sure those resources uh, get down here. And then we're going to continue to work on other ways. Uh, right. 
uh, fentanyl, you've heard about that. We're trying to find ways to make sure they've been able to mail that in and people buy that over the internet. We've got a bill to try to stop that. But we're going to continue to work. This is an area uh, I feel very passionate about. I'm very big on prevention, mm -hmm. and I think we've got to work closely with our schools at a younger age, maybe fifth or sixth grade or fourth grade, because right. you might have an older brother or sister who might bring it into the house. And we've got to stop this. I mean, I just... Uh, I was at a boys and girls club meeting in uh, Mantee County, and they said that you know children make up t uh, 25 percent of the population, but 100 percent of the future. And we've got to make sure they don't go down. They think it's an innocent pill, and find themselves uh, dead three or four months later. I've had too many of those stories. And I'm going to do everything I can to continue to fight with local leaders and representatives, not just in Washington, but as well as in Tallahassee and in the county to find a way, more ways that we can stop this. It's just pathetic. And, and clearly one of the things that you mentioned, sir, was about education and outreach and having resources that are going to be available to help people. And one of the great organizations in Manatee County that really does a center stone and mm -hmm. it provides a wide range of uh, support services and resources for people that are in the throes of addiction. Uh, so hopefully, you know, some of that federal money will see, find its way to center stone so they can continue the work that they do. Well, center stone does a great job. I probably talked to them two, three times a year year our staff works with them but I got to tell you I've had a nephew that's had a challenge with this and once you go through that gate and you get involved in this drug culture prescription drugs or other it's not impossible but it's very difficult mm -hmm. to bring people back alcoholism is the same way and we've got to prevent that from happening in the first place with as many kids as we can that's just my personal belief uh, and you know all of us are touched by it all of us have our immediate families or our, you know extended families that have these issues and we've got to find a way for it not to start in the first place and that's where we're putting a lot of our emphasis but also organizations like center zone we're going to do everything we can to make sure they've got additional support so if someone does go down that that road uh, we can try to get them back on the right track Congressman, another societal issue that I'd like for you to take a few minutes to talk about is the, the, the scourge of human trafficking. Here in Florida, it's on the rise. It's, it's a serious issue nationwide. What are some of the things that, you know, what's your take on this and, and how can we combat this, this terrible uh, human trafficking problem? Well, I, I didn't realize it was as huge as it was. I know it was a big factor, but we're the third worst state in the country. Of course, we're the third largest population, so you'd make some correlation, unfortunately, there. But it's something that we're trying to work on. I just had a meeting with uh, Democrats and Republicans. As you know, I co-chair the Florida delegation, and I can just tell you there's a lot of passion on both sides to do what we can to make a difference in this area. We just got a bill that got signed into law for $130 million for prevention uh, and assistance to people that have been victims. And uh, But we need to do more in this area, but it's just very tragic and it's another part of the society that unfortunately we're dealing with, but it needs to be dealt with in a very aggressive way. And we need to make sure that people are perpetuating these kind of tragedies uh, that they serve more than ample time uh, in the big house. Well, you know, one of the things that you mentioned too in this community, both uh, uh, Sheriff Wells and in Sarasota, Sheriff Knight, are very active in pursuing people who, you know, perpetuate this human trafficking. Uh, they have innovative programs that help young women, and as well as they're going after these perpetrators as well. Yeah. And Manatee and Sarasota should be very proud of their efforts. Yeah, it's not just what we do at the federal level. This is a team effort, our first responders, our sheriffs, our police departments, uh, our local of officials, all of us working together to try to knock this scourge out. And we're going to, we're gonna, we need to put a bigger dent into it, uh, but it is a, a, another you know, big time challenge, but we'll overcome it. Uh, Congressman Buchanan, I wanna take a, a moment here to talk about something that's that's really significant, and hats off to you for being able to accomplish this. Um, you're also the first Florida member of the Congress to receive the Humane Society Legislator of the Year Award for fighting animal cruelty and protecting endangered species, and you're to be congratulated for that. 
However, you just recently successfully called on President Trump to stop the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service from ending the ban on African elephant trophies. And I think that they wanted to reinstate that so people could get trophies and bring back in. You and others in Congress said, not so fast, and uh, you said, and they changed their mind, which is to be... Uh, you're to be congratulated for that. But you're also leading the efforts on keeping the manatee uh, on the endangered species list, and you've also fought hard for the Florida panther. But tell us a little bit why it's so important for you uh, as an individual, with all these other many things to worry about, to put your care and attention to these animal rights programs. When we run for office, we think about the veterans, small business, families being stronger. But as you get involved here, you know, an area that you, you realize is just in terms of animals, just the passion people have for pets. So you look at this thing that came up last week with elephants thinking that they're going to, I mean, I think I read every 18 minutes they kill an elephant to take the tusk. I mean, it's beyond belief. And I think the other thought is just simply, I've got involved with and why I got the Humane Society, because things like panthers uh, in Florida or right. our treasure or manatees, yeah. it's named after Manatee County, uh, we need to make sure they're protected. And they're, they're talking about lifting some of those protections. And I'm going to fight against that and make sure that they are protected. I'm trying to represent the best I can, 800,000 people. And a lot of people feel passionate about not just the manatee and the panther and the elephant, but also about their pets. Right. And uh, so it's something that it's very easy to get uh, excited about when there's uh, something that's not right. Well, again, hats off to you, sir, for not only being recognized for your efforts, uh, but for being able to, to say, just wait a minute, let's look at this uh, fish and wildlife uh, policy and see if it's the right policy at the right time. And I think, you know, through your efforts and others that you enlisted in the, in the effort, uh, that policy was then rescinded. So congratulations on that. Yeah, and I, you know, uh, President Trump, uh, the thought was to maybe relax some of that, and I just thought that's the wrong policy. And when it's wrong, I'm going to call him out on it. Well, let's talk about another policy that you, you kind of called out on that. Was, that was you opposed uh, pr the president's decision to pull out of the Paris Accords. Um, this was a big deal. This was a major emphasis. Tell us why this was uh, something that you disagreed with the president about and uh, were very vocal about it. Well, I think if you look at uh, the whole thing on climate change, we were one of two or three countries in the world. I think we were there with Afghanistan and maybe one other country. It just made no sense. There's enough evidence. I've got grandchildren. I am concerned about climate change. Uh, so it's something we've got to take serious and take a look at. You know, I'm not an expert in that area, but there's enough people that are that I think that we need to give it some consideration. So I've called on the president to rethink that, reconsider it, because I think we need to be with the rest of the nations in the country protecting our planet. And one of the key things, too, if I may say so, Congressman, is that you come from the great state of Florida, you know, and we were very uh, uh, protective of our natural resources. You know, with the sea level rise and flooding issues, you know, you have to be very cognizant of what the environment is, how it's affecting the state that we love. Yeah, well, I think you'd see Florida, if it is a, as big of a concern as they ex expressed that it might be, uh, Florida could be number one in terms of rising seas. And uh, a lot of us enjoy the waterfront, and but you know, you just go down and look at the Everglades, and half of the most of that is water. So it doesn't take much. Lake Okeechobee and some of these other areas where you could find Florida someday. I'm not alarmist, but uh, down the road, 30, 50, 70 years of state that we love, uh, really having some real challenges with it. I, you know, I see homes that are on the verge of falling into the Gulf of Mexico. I've right. been there right. and when the seas come right up to the shore. So, you know, the seas come up a couple of feet, it changes everything. Everything. And, uh, you know, the projections or no projections, you know, we're seeing, you know, uh, beach erosion at an incredible rate. So uh, I think it was very important for you to be able to say, hey, listen, let's take a moment and reflect on this and see where the great information. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you for doing that, Congressman. But one of the key things, and I, I think you know, uh, your district should be very proud of this, is that you're a senior member of the House Ways and Means Committee, a very powerful committee in, in, in the House. Um, that has jurisdiction over taxes, trade, uh, Social Security, and Medicare. Uh, critical things. 
But in Florida's 16th district, it's one of the oldest districts in the United States. And seniors rely very much critically on these programs. How are we confirming to those seniors that they're going to get their benefits that they're entitled to? Well, as you mentioned, 65 and older, between veterans issues, uh, senior issues as it relates to Medicare and Social Security, and I can tell you I've talked to a lot of people, I'd say probably a third of people 65 and older, all they have is Medicare and Social Security. Right. Not just in my district, but I'm sure across the country I've read those statistics. Right. So we've got to make sure, first off, Social Security is their money. We've got to make sure that's viable in their long term. And then on Medicare, as costs keep going up, we've got to make sure that that stays strong. So that's my biggest passion. Uh, is a member on the Ways and Means Committee, and I am more of a senior member. It's hard to believe that, but I am one of more of the senior member. That's my main focus, is make sure we protect our veterans, we protect our seniors, and by protecting our seniors, we've got to make sure Medicare and Social Security are strong long term. Social Security is good or solid until the, the experts say till 2032, and Medicare not as long. But both those programs we've got to solidify long term, not just for current seniors, but for their children and grandchildren. Where can you go and get health care, for example, at 65? You can't, even if you could, you'd be spending 3000 or more a month. It's just insane. So we have to make sure they're strong long term, and I'm committed to that. Well, I think uh, your constituents will remember, sir, that you brought down the Social Security Administrator uh, for a town hall forum. I, I believe it was over at uh, USF or New College. Um, and you asked the tough questions. How long is this going to work? And you listened to your constituents' concern. So that's really a major concern as the population begin continues to age, that senior population wants to know about their benefits. Yeah, and let me, let me just tell you, that it's changed because and we're going to have to make some tough decisions on a Democrat, Democrats and Republicans working together. My mother-in-law, uh, 98, her sister just passed away, I think, at 95 or 96. She had a sister, 101, 103. People are living a lot longer, right. and, uh, and they're healthier. So we've got to make sure that this makes sense long term. A lot of these programs in the 30s and 60s were put in place where people lived on average 10, 15 years. Uh, they passed away 10 or 15 years earlier. So we've got to make sure these are strong programs long term, but we're going to have to do that as well on a bipartisan basis into the future. Well, let me ask you this then, sir, because I, I, I've seen or you know, I've heard that you're working on a program to help people get hearing aids. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's not just for senior population anymore. But tell us how you got, became involved in that and why that's important to you. Well, in talking with a lot of people, I've got people that work for me, they can't afford them. Many times they're four to seven thousand dollars for a decent hearing aid. Right. They'll go get a, a, one that's less expensive, uh, but then it doesn't work well. So to get a decent hearing aid can be five to seven thousand dollars, and the thought is we've got a bill out there, and and uh, we'll make, allow them to buy them less expensive, uh, and bring more competition hmm. in the pharmacies and other places. And we think we can bring them down substantially, so everybody that wants to get a hearing aid can afford to get one. A lot of people right now, and I mentioned one third of people. 65 and older, uh, that's all they have is Social Security and Medicare. They're getting by week to week, month to month. They like to get hearing aids, but they can't afford them. Or maybe they had them six right. years ago, they need a different hearing aid, and they can't afford it. So my goal is to find a way to get the cost down a lot, not just a little, a lot, so everybody can have access to affordable hearing aids. Well, when you come back the next time, I want to hear, if you could, an update on, on how that's going, because I think that's very important. Again, we're talking about this aging population. Yeah. But let's take a look at the opposite side. We've talked about the seniors and an aging population, but one of the key things that you've been involved with is you've fought to extend funding for children's health insurance yeah. uh, repeatedly. Um, in 2007, you voted to override the President uh, George W. Bush's veto of that program. Children's insurance is critical to many working families. Tell us why it's important to you and why you want to see that program continue. Well, when I first got to Congress uh, and I had to look at this issue, it wasn't something that I thought about, but I had to take a look at children's health care. And you realize that most of the health care in America is getting spent towards the end of someone's life. 
it's inexpensive to take care of the kids. <laughs> it's immoral not to take care of the kids, in my mind. I'm a blue-collar kid. My parents worked in the factory. I just believe every child should have access to affordable health care. And even though I voted against that bill in terms of my party, it's the right vote, and I've consistently taken that vote because, as I mentioned earlier, children make up 25 percent of the population, 100 percent of the future. Every child needs to have access to affordable health care or health care, and I'm going to continue to fight for that. And again, you know, Congressman, whenever you want to come back and update and all the progress that you've made, we'd be happy to hear that. Now, unfortunately, we only have a couple of minutes left. And I'd just like to, to, to hear what's next for you. What are those issues that are facing you as you go back to the Hill? I mean, very shortly. What do you see on the horizon that's going to take all your attention? The biggest issue right now for the next month or two is going to be tax reform, giving everybody a tax cut, letting people keep more of what they earn. Uh, and then after that, uh, you know, we continue to work on, I think, the biggest issue we've got in America other than that is health care and affordable health care. Uh, it's just got outrageous, the cost. I read somewhere in the paper 62 percent of Americans, I think it's in the USA today, 62 percent of Americans don't have $1,000 in the bank. And I thought about that. I had to read it twice. But what came back to me, the mindset was, is I'm a guy that's been employing people for 30 years before I got here. We provided health care for every employee, and we paid it all, mm. and it was affordable. Mm. Today, what's happening is a lot of the cost is getting pushed to the, the employee, so he's, they're having to pay six or 7,000, right. and then you got a seven to $8,000 deductible. That is gutting financially the middle class. So I think the biggest issue we've got to work together on a bipartisan basis is to get health care affordable. It needs to be half of what it is today. We need complete reform. It's not working. It works for a few, but most it doesn't, and we've got to get the cost of health care down. That's my biggest issue. Well, Congressman, again, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to visit us. These are always uh, enlightening and informative sessions every time that you get a chance to do here. Six terms as a U.S. Congressman from the 16th District, uh, co-chair of the Florida Delegation on the powerful House Ways, House Ways and Means Committee. Um, you know, obviously, you know, you continue to do good work for your constituents and this community. Uh, Congressman, Again, thank you very much for joining us, and we welcome you back anytime. Charles, thanks for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. Thank and thank you. you for joining us on this special edition of the Congressional Report. We'll see you next time on Manatee Educational Television.